Hi guys, I'm Jo Croft. You are listening to the Puppy Coach Podcast. Join me as I share my top tips, thoughts and experiences from my career as a vet nurse and canine behaviour specialist, helping owners form a strong, safe relationship with their dog. Hi guys, thanks for listening today. We have got joining us Barbara Sykes, um, the one and only famous Border Collie trainer with me today and I want to pick her brains all things border collies and chat about dogs in general and the behavior world just to give you a little intro into Barbara um she grew up with border collies from being a small child she's been everywhere she's trained them for for tv she's appeared on tv herself she's written some fabulous newspaper articles for national newspapers she's represented Great Britain at the international sheepdog trials she is also a member of the canine feline behavior association and the British Institute of Professional Dog Trainers. She is founder and trustee of the Freedom of Spirit Trust for Border Collie Rescue and runs her own mainline Border Collie Rescue Centre. She is also an amazing author of seven books uh, and also a co-author of another one. So she is all things Border Collie and we're going to hope to bring you today lots and lots of information on them. So hi Barbara, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Sounds good, does all that. Really you're, good. Well, you're amazing. I know that you're absolutely my go-to whenever I get a border collie and I'm scratching my head. I'm on the phone, aren't I? So um, shall we just start by you just giving us a bit of a rundown on your kind of early life and where you got this really amazing experiential grounding around border collies? Right. Well, born on the farm, brought up with border collies. I guess I use them as baby walkers almost. I... We used to, we, well, we had a stray dog come into the farmyard and I called it Kip because it kicked in the building for about a month and then it moved on. Occasionally we'd get stray dogs and I just would, would take them in. Uh, by the time I was 17 or 18, I was really hooked on the sheepdog trial in and a lot of the things I learned from the old shepherds, some of them they are amazing mentors, they really are. Some of the things that they say, example, one gentleman said, I said to one guy, you never shout at your dog, you never raise your voice. He said, oh, I do. I said, no, you don't. He said, oh, I do. He said, but you see, I train my dog to whisper. These dogs can hear something a mile away. So why would you speak loud when they're right in front of you? I train them to a whisper. So when I speak in a normal voice, he thinks I'm shouting at it. (laughs) That was a good lesson to learn. That's amazing. And we do talk very loud all the time to our dogs. We don't need to. So do you use your voice much, Barbara, for, for training? Because there's quite a lot of kind of difference in of opinions of, you know, how much body language you use, how much voice to use, whether you use equipment. So what's your kind of go-to for, for basic training? Probably none of the standard, because I think sometimes we misinterpret the, the, the phrase body language. Mm-hmm. Because if you're going to use body language with a dog, what we tend to do as humans is use what we think. Yeah. Example, pointing to the floor or putting our hand down to make the dog lie down, which means the dog is having to learn that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the body language that we use in behavioural work with them and in the rescue is a body language that the dog would understand. So, for example, if we stand across the front of the dog with our back to it, the collie automatically knows you're actually in control and you will take care of anything that's approaching me so I don't have to worry about it. We put our hands behind our back and they stay there. When we walk forward and drop our hands, that is an automatic signal that they can move forward if they want and go in front of us. Think of it as if you couldn't speak a word of French and you had somebody who couldn't speak English, Mm -hmm. there would be no point in you pointing to something and saying, that's a cup. Yeah. Because that cup would have become, that's a cup. They'd interpret their entire sentence. So you point to it and say cup, and you yeah. only say it once, otherwise it becomes a cup, cup, cup. Yeah. <laughs> but because we're human, we can, we can bypass some of that confusion. A dog can't bypass it. So when somebody's teaching a dog to sit down, they will push it on its back end and make it sit down. The first thing a dog does is resist. Yeah. But it's resisting that push. Eventually it'll do it because it's close to hand and then it'll probably get a treat for it and it thinks, oh, well, you push my bottom, I sit down and I get a sweeter. Whereas if you just gently tip the, the chin up a little bit and ease them back, they think, I need to sit down. Yeah, to be able to look up. Yeah. Yeah. So as they're sitting down, we say sit. So we never teach them words. We tell them what they're doing when they're doing it. 
Yeah. So if we stand in the doorway and the dog can't get out, we will say to it, you're waiting, that's wait. Yeah. So we wait until the dog does something. If a dog comes to me and lays down, I will say, down, good dog. Yeah. So we just tell them what they're doing. In the same way, you would the person who couldn't speak your language. They pick a cup up and you point to the cup and you say, cup. So this delivery of, of good behaviours, what we perceive to be good behaviours, you would just essentially be marking that with kind words and vocal tone. So you're not reaching for your treat bag for all of these things. It's literally just a change in your demeanour. Uh, far too intelligent. If they think they can get away with bribing somebody, <laughs> they bribe them. Originally, and still, the Border Collie is a working sheepdog. It is a working dog. And the farmer doesn't stop his dog at the back of the sheep and say, oh, you did that well, come to me and I'll give you a treat and I'll go back and carry on. Yeah. If you have a child, send yeah. you a picture. Yeah. And you'd say to that child, oh, you're doing really well. That picture's lovely. Here, would you like um, a sweetie or a drink of pop? Now, they accept the praise, but the momentum has gone. They've been put off. If you say to that child, so proud of you, then they'll carry on to try and make you even more proud. It's your tone of voice. Don't get me wrong. Every single rescue dog, when it goes back into its pen, it has a biscuit waiting for it. You know, it's like the mint on the pillow. We want it to go back into its pen. All my own dogs, they all get a biscuit at bedtime when we go to bed. But for actually teaching them, to me there's a difference between training and good manners. I think it's, it's a rude dog that pulls on the lead and pushes through the door in front of you just like it's rude of a child. Yeah, there's times when they run out to meet grandparents, the dog runs out to meet somebody that they know, but basic good manners is important. Training to me is extracurriculum. Yeah. Give us a pull, roll over, push the ball to me, that, that's training. Mm-hmm. So at the end of a training session... I would give them a treat, but only at the end of the session, not when they do each thing. And the border collies want to please. They are companions. They like to know they're doing something right for you. And good dog means an awful lot to them. Mm. If you start, good dog, yeah. they're all jumping up and down and they get hyper. And then you can't control that because they're beyond threshold and struggling to yeah. even be normal. Yeah. Once that adrenaline starts flowing, they like the feeling. Yeah. The adrenaline starts flowing, they like the feeling. The human being is excited because the dog is excited. The dog picks up the energy of the human being and you've got a, a hit-on-hit situation. That's when they start getting ridiculous and yapping or nipping. So I guess that follows on if you take in, you know, if you've got that going on in the house and you then take that dog outside, commonly what, what we would see Border Collies for in pet dog homes are their classic innate behaviours. They're chasing cyclists, they're snapping at heels, they're, they've lost it over cars and, and traffic. I could weep at the number of dogs I've got waiting to come into rescue with all those problems. Oh. But they're not born chasing a ball or a bicycle. Yeah. And they do know the difference between a flock of sheep and a group of children. Yeah. But what happens is the children have played with them. So children become siblings to the collie. Collies can nip siblings. That's perfectly acceptable. We don't nip mum because she's going to tell us off for it. Yeah. But we can nip siblings. And if the child wants to nip the dog back, fair play. But of course, by this time, the dog has bitten the child and the parents are upset and the dog's either put to sleep or put into rescue. Mm. But if the children are taught to respect the dog and not play endlessly with it, and that the dog is taught that it has to do what the child says or keep away from the child, it doesn't happen. We, we never have had cases of farm children being taken into hospital because they've been bitten by the sheepdog. Yeah. Because respect is there, it has to be there, but... So many times, and, and this, this playing with the ball, ah, oh, once you start throwing the ball for a dog and it chases after it, for collies are bred to control movement. That's, in, that's their heritage. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to throw a ball for it, it has to control it. You have to get it. It must stop it. But it stops it. It picks it up. Sometimes it brings it back. Sometimes it doesn't. But the ultimate for the human being is for this collie to bring the ball back. We have now told that very intelligent brain it is acceptable to chase something and grab it. Yeah. And it's funny when they chase the water that comes out of the hose pipe, and it might be funny when they chase something on television. But we're endorsing it now. Mm -hmm. All right, there's somebody on a bicycle, I grab it. There's children running past, I grab them. It doesn't mean they can't have fun, but everything with a collie has to be controlled, otherwise they make their own decision. You you roll the ball and tell the dog, wait. You only go when I tell you you can go. Now they'll understand that. That's clear cut for them. They can understand it. You, you rolled it, but I can't go for it until you say I can. And occasionally stop them halfway down and bring them back. 
so that the, the chase isn't the be-all and end-all. They've got to learn when to control movement and when to let movement happen. Obviously, most of the time I see them and they've had a ball thrown to kingdom come. You know, they're, they're, some of them are even in rehab physically because of ball throwing. And I think that's such an important point that you raise about this innate drive is opened up. You know, how do people control this? And it, again, it's all about arousal. So if you same with a ball breed, if you're playing with rugger toys, you don't take them until their eyes are popping out of their head and they're hanging off of something. You just get them to pick up the toy, say good boy, and then out as a start point for arousal. So essentially what you're saying is the same thing with a collie. Yes, we can use the ball as control, but it is in a very controlled, low level way under your direction. Yeah, and, and to be fair to some of the owners that go on, onto the internet and every bit of information is a collie must be doing. You must keep it mentally and physically on the go. You, you, you must feed the information that it needs into it. Therefore, it must be doing agility, it must be doing fly ball, it must be chasing after a ball. You must keep it going. And I have yet to meet a farmer who says, oh, it's lambing time, I've no work for my dog, I'll go out and buy a frisbee. Yeah. Because what, what these dogs need is companionship. They are the shepherd's working companion. Going out at 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, in the old days, just man and dog. When I hear people say, because there's so, so many excuses, they were weaned too soon, weaned too late, um, they were under-socialised, over socialized Well, I've got a farm dog, I shouldn't have got a farm dog. It's what they are. Yeah. If the dog isn't physically or mentally capable of working sheep. That doesn't mean they say it has to do it, but if it isn't physically or mentally capable of doing it, then it's not actually a proper collie. It's been downbred somewhere. Right. To get that amazing intelligence that they have, that love for companionship and that passion to be part of what you are and what you're doing, to get that, then you have to have a proper working bred border collie. Yeah, so if somebody's looking for that, that border collie that they can work with is amenable, biddable, etc. It's not necessarily going to be that litter of dogs that are ultra, ultra busy or the dogs that I see where they're, they're hyperactive. They're not just busy. And, you know, we do go in, don't we? And we look at the situation and we think, OK, is this environment? Is it relationship? Is it genetics? You know, what are we looking at here? And obviously our role is to then try and break that jigsaw puzzle down. But essentially what you've just said to me is, these hyper busy dogs that can't stop that are borderline obsessive compulsive or are obsessive compulsive and I'll I'll chat to you about that later but you know are not necessarily well bred farm dogs because that wouldn't work would it? It goes back to when people are bringing a dog in to rescue there's a reason why that dog has to come in to rescue but it is never they occasionally it is genuine and somebody will say look I got it wrong or this happened but I get tired of the excuses of, it's because it's the farm dog. Mm. Oh, well, my, my dog trainer didn't understand my... And, and at the end of the day, there was a lady who rang me up yesterday. And she, she says she trains dog for sheep work. She says she understands the breed. And she's got one she can't understand. And what colour is it? Tricolour. Is it long or short-coated? It's short-coated. It's father's high back blade. And she said he breeds hyperactive dogs. And I said, well, just a minute. Mm. High back blade is a supreme international champion. He's an amazing dog, tricolored and long-coated. And I said, I have a four-year-old bitch sat at my feet, tricolored and short-coated, and her father's high back leg. She's not hyper. Mm. She's perfectly calm. They're not born hyperactive. I said, it's the diet you fed the dog, and it's the management that's made it as it is, because that short-coated tricolored dog is far more sensitive and far more likely to get overexcited than it's longer coated black and white cousin would be. Yeah. And I think this is where it goes wrong a lot of the time because they're as diverse as us. We can be black haired, blonde haired, red haired, hair shaped, and goodness knows what's other shape, we're all different. And you can often look at somebody and think, oh, you know, I bet they're fiery, I bet they're placid, and that's your border collie. We can often say, I bet it's short coated and try coated for years, isn't it? How did you know that? Because You've just described everything that that dog would do, given the diet you've given it and the way you've hyped it up. Yeah. And it, it, understanding that genetic line, whereas I would say to anybody, if you're wanting a border collie puppy and you have children or you lead a busy life, don't go get a short-coated tricolour. Don't just look at the parent because it skips a generation. Find out what the grandparents are. But people don't, they go and buy a puppy. Yeah. without knowing what's in the background of it. And that background is so important to know how to manage it. My son, 
But my son and daughter in the forties, my son's blonde with blue eyes. My daughter's dark hair with brown eyes. I can assure you they both have the same part. There's a milkman in there, Barbara, oh. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the same mother and same father, I can promise you. But they both have to be treated differently in certain circumstances. One was far more sensitive than the other. Yeah. So if we know that we have to handle children differently, even in the same genetic pool, then you've got to handle, especially college, differently, even in the same genetic pool, because... Two little mates, one can be black and white and long coated and one can be short coated and tri coated and that's where the difference comes in. I mean, I had a, a Kelpie cross. I wouldn't think that was particularly intentional, obviously the one that I rang you about, who, by the way, is still doing amazingly well. He's managed kind of day to day with a Gen Con, loose Gen Con, done really well with that. And then she, away from that, she's starting to do a little bit of canny cross with him. But amazing boundaries, really consistent with her boundaries, really consistent with her direction, very calm house. They absolutely adore him now, so they've done really well. So I'm proud of that. Time and patience, it's something a lot of people don't put in. Yeah, and do you know what? Do you know what's really interesting? The point I said to them, you need to love him now, now that you're not frightened of him anymore. So this, just for the the listeners, this was a Kelpie cross-border collie that I called you about, Barbara, didn't I? Just because they were very concerned over his aggressive behaviour. So he was attacking them in the home. He delivered five full thickness bites to them at random times, um, usually going through doorways or if they entered his space. So things were pretty bad when I got involved in... We've done a a YouTube video on him because they did so well with the plan that I set. But the point at which I said to them, you keep consistent with your boundaries, but when you are interacting with him, tell him he's a good boy and love him. And that made a massive difference, actually, just for them on an emotional platform to know when and how to deliver human love and emotion, how to do that and not just to be throwing food all the time, but actually deliver it vocally. But also from the perspective of the dog, you know, it really made me realise that he just wanted to know what on earth do these people want me to do, like the expectation was of. The right word is love. And I'll say that to people who say, oh, I take him out in the morning, I do a ball train afternoon, I do a... Do you ever actually sit down and just say, I love you. <laughs> I have a deaf dog and I'll blow him a kiss, but... Quite often I'll mouth it, I love you, I really love you. And it picks it up off my face and the energy that's coming from me is important. I agree. I really agree. I have a, my training words are, you're amazing, when I want some buzz out of them. And, uh, and absolutely when we're at home and I'm sitting calmly, it's like, I love you so much. It's yeah, that stupid yeah. change in your voice. So just returning to that kind of pedigree mix thing, are you seeing many of those coming through for rescue? Do you accept those? Do you call in collie crosses? Okay. Um, but <sighs> I'm probably going to be very unpopular, but I do not agree with mixing breeds. I don't agree with it. Back in the day, they were mongrels. They were mongrels. That's exactly what they were. But I don't yeah. know. We didn't have all these issues with mongrels, though. So I guess we finally bred our pedigree dogs to such a high level, and then we shoved those, that genetic material together, and we've just got yeah. conflict. There's, there's, there's an awful lot of problems with, with a lot of them. And there, I won't say there's enough dogs in this country. There's too many dogs in this country to be doing things like this and mixing breeds. I, I don't understand why we can't just be happy with the amazing, when I say purebred, I mean completely bred dogs. I don't mean they have to be pedigrees. Um, once again, a shepherd once said to me, what is pedigree? Yeah. He said it's just a piece of paper with a load of names on it that are totally worthless unless you understand the gene pools of those names which is true, which is why we get a lot of inbreeding because people aren't going far enough back on the breeding. Yeah. But when you mix in breeds like that, I, I just I don't see why we can't be happy with what we've got. No. The Border Collie is an amazing animal. And yes, they, they get crossed with kelpies and they get crossed with hunterways. And you are mixing working breed to working breed, which isn't quite as bad, but why mix it? The hunterway is a New Zealand big, strong, barking dog. The kelpie. Just as a border collie is bred to control movement, the kelp is bred to control speed. But they run for miles and miles. They're on the backs of thousands of sheep in Australia. They're too, they're too fast for this country. And if people want them, then they've got to say, well, I'm going to keep it as a calm companion. But then why cross it with a border collie? I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. No. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but I appreciate and I love a dog as it is and the breed that it is. And you get to understand that breed that you love so why cross it with something else? It's, it's fashion is a lot of it and I hate it. 
even just within border collies, the, the behaviours that you get in line with that gene pool are quite diverse, as you would expect. So then you add in a different breed again and it's on a whole nother level I mean what how diverse is that border collie spectrum so I would like a border collie I want to do some training with it want to have some fun don't necessarily want a a massive working drive from a visual perspective what should a pet dog owner be looking for to kind of have that dog and not your smooth coated highly efficient completely driven working dog um medium coated try call a medium coated it's a combination. So you can have a short-coated tricolour dog and it can be a soft tricolour and it, it can have drop over ears and hazel eyes. That's not a problem. But if you get a short-coated tricolour dog where it's a short, very harsh coat, it's got a really bright tricolour on it, it's got big, fat, pricked up ears and it's got amber eyes, then my daughter said to me two years ago, they should not be in pet homes. And I said, harsh. I now agree with her because they don't understand that amber eye. The amber eye is the dog, that's the dog that can walk up to one sheep and it will hypnotise it with its gaze until the shepherd can get there to catch the sheep. But then you get that dog in a domestic situation and somebody's walking it on the road and a stranger comes up and looks at it and they will look at it because that amber eyed dog will stare at them because that's its job. Yeah. And then the person stares back, no matter how nice they are, the dog will flick its lip at them because... That's a challenge. That person has challenged them. Then the person gets upset. The owner gets upset. Then the dog reacts and starts growling because it now thinks there's a dangerous situation. Yeah. If the person, if the owner had stepped across the front of the dog and put the dog behind them, that would have diffused the situation. The dog would have understood, you're taking over, I don't need to master this one. But once it's done it, it's going to keep doing it. Their fight and flight distances are greater than the hazel eyed dog. And if the person who gets that dog doesn't understand it, then it gets into a situation where it gets really snappy. And it's not the dog's fault. It's not the breed's fault. And it's not really the owner's fault. They just didn't understand it. Yeah. Which is the reason for the books is to try and get people, before you get the dog, understand what it is that you're getting. Your black and white hazel eyes put with a longish coat and he stares at the television a couple of times. He's fine. He's seen it. He's... It's interesting to him. He's not going to control it. He might try it once. Now then, the short-coated to try colour put with the big prick ears, he's going to look at it and he's going to think, I can control that. So you stop him straight away. You're bringing out what you want in your dog. When a man has got 100 sheep and one dog, he wants him to be a jack-of-all-trades. If he's got 1,000 sheep and two or three dogs, he wants one to go out and gather them, one to drive them away and one to hypnotise them. So it's the shepherd's job to bring out what he wants and subdue what he doesn't want. So once you know what you've got in the border collie you've got in your home, you know what you can bring out without a problem and what you need to bring down and keep it. It's a scale. Don't let that go up. It'll be a problem. Bring it down in line with the other side and it won't be a problem. I was always kind of any, anything with a blue eye, either one blue eye or two blue eyes, when we were in vet practice, was always kind of keep your eyes on type scenario. I mean, are these big genetic red flags? Or do you, no. is there no truth in, in that? blue eye's got some merle in it somewhere in the background. A working collie merle is usually too busy to think of being aggressive or causing problems. They're always on the go. Mm. You know, they've got a dominant gene in them. If you've got two blue eyes, <laughs> oh, I always say, crazy dog, crazy dog. I had one blue merle with two blue eyes. He was never ever still. That mm. dog was fed on porridge all winter, um, all summer, and he was given a, a, a complete food in winter because he couldn't. He could not cope with a complete food in summer. It was just so high, so much energy. But it's the other eye that tells you. So if you've got one blue eye and the other's amber, which is very rare, well, then you've got that gene. Most of them, the other eye will be just a hazel eye. My little collie, she's got both her eyes are hazel, but she's got a blue fleck in one, which says, ah, you've got it in there somewhere. You've got that crazy gene. For example, when I went away for two days last week, she just stood on the beach for a moment and thought, there's a boat out there. I'm going back to gate. And just set off swimming. <laughs> I'm running after her up to my waist saying, no, oh, I'll do it, come back. <laughs> it just says that blue fleck in the eye. You're crazy. To know what you've got, then you can learn to love what you've got. 
can't remember who told me now when I was much younger I had a conversation with somebody about behavior we were talking about breeds and they said if you line a, a Labrador and a Collie up next to each other on the edge of the cliff and tell the Collie to jump it will jump if you tell the Labrador the Labrador will look at you like you're mad I think if I put my, one of my Collies on top of a cliff and said jump they'd say oh we're polite after you <laughs> <laughs> got some manners what do you think about the whole um the fly ball and the agility and you know everything I couldn't believe so Sunday was like 29 degrees here in the UK and there were like agility competitions going on I was in absolute shock I mean you have to assume that there are paddling pools and lots of water and shade and cooling coats and stuff going on you have to assume that but I mean, I, you know, I look at these dogs, I stop everything. When I go out and assess them for, for behaviour cases and qualities, they're already doing fly ball and agility and ball throwing, and I just stop everything. What's your opinion on these, the fun dog sports, the, the pet dog owner doing these high energy dog sports and winding their collies up? Is there any good that can come out of this? Um, well, they're not really doing it for the dog, are they? Because they want to do it. I, I've, I've, I've never yet had a dog look at me and said, you know what, I want to do a fly ball, I want to do agility, it's a good talk. But, once again, they get on a high with the owner. But I've bred a pup many, many, many years ago. I mean, I stopped breeding 15, 20 years ago. And this was one of the first ones. It went to a girl in Nottinghamshire, and it was one of the first ones to go to Cruft, um doing agility. But I could also have sold hundreds of pups on the strength of that dog because one guy ran me up and he said, I was amazed at that dog. She stood in the queue. I thought, I'm going to beat that dog easily. Because it just sat at the side of her. And when she went in, she just pointed to where she wanted it to go and walked around. They went, oh, everything came out, came away with a prize. Mm. And he said, I can't believe it. Are you breeding? I said, no, I'm not, because I don't breed for agility. I happen to know her, and that's why she got that book. But she didn't get it wound up. She used to do agility classes, and they weren't allowed to be wound up. But her agility classes stopped because people thought they were boring because they weren't getting any fun out of it. Wow, okay. Well, it, it, it sums it up a little bit. I'm not saying it's wrong, it's each to their own. But I can remember when the council first accepted them in the show ring and somebody in a sheepdog world said, the sooner the breed two breeds of collie, the better. And I said, oh, if it's what they want to do, as long as the dog's got a good home. And now I can't agree with what I said and I can't agree with what she said because there are two different breeds of border collie and it's ruining them. Mm. And I cannot agree with this amazing, intelligent, beautiful breed of dog having to stand for hours and hours and hours on a bench and have somebody poke them all over. I don't agree with it. No, neither do I. They're a breed apart. They are proud. These dogs can work things out so amazingly well. I put a little bitch out around a flock of sheep years and years ago and we shepherded and the sheep came down and she didn't come. Mm. We got in the truck, drove to the top of the hill and there was a sheep stuck in a ditch and she sat there waiting for her to go and get it. Aww. She knew what was needed of her. They can work it out. These dogs go at the back of a flock of sheep and you can tell them to go to the left and they won't do it. And you have to have enough faith in that dog to know that it knows better than you because it's near the sheep and you're not. And it'll go to the right and it'll bring the stray sheep back in. Then it'll go to the left and do what you told it to do. They can work the situation out. They know which is going to be the wrong sheep. Gosh, what do we say about males and females in the human species? <laughs> Women can um, multitask, multitask, men can't. Yeah. We're, we're always saying that. The border collie can multitask where other breeds can't. It can work things out. It can work a situation out. Listen to what you're saying. Decide what it needs to do. Trust you that you won't get annoyed with it and do it. A long time ago, I had a sheep jump out of the pen. And it raced up the field. And my old girl was sat at the side of the field. Before that... She had reached the far side of the field. She'd gone round it, brought it back, put it in the pen, and then went and sat back in the corner again. What? She knew the job. She knew the sheep shouldn't have done it. But I hate to see that not being used like that. Yeah. If, if you want to do agility, my daughter did this with her dog when she was a kid. Stand at the corner and name what jump you want it to go over and mm-hmm. see how it does it. Mm-hmm. Make them use the brain. But you see, the human being isn't getting fun out of that. Sheep dog trialling now, there's so many people doing it and the dogs don't work for a living. It, it, it is a hobby. But when it comes to the big international trials, those dogs aren't to be seen because the international trials are, are just amazing. Anybody who has a border collie should at some point go and see the international sheep dog trial on the Supreme Championship Day. These dogs go out half a mile and they'll gather 10 sheep. 
from a corner angle. So we'll bring them into the middle of the field, then they're sent back another half mile to gather 10 more sheep. When they bring them back, the first 10 have disappeared. It's their job to get them all back together again. And when they've done the course, they will separate five marked sheep from the 20 that they've got together. It's amazing. I never, ever watch an international trial without I get a tear in my eye. Because it's just they're amazing. It just made me think, actually, you know, when I look at dogs working, I can usually sit there and know the plan. I might not know exactly how that dog has got to do in what it's done, but if it's scent work or working trials or whatever it happens to be, I can have a rough idea of how somebody's trained the dog to do that. But you don't, I don't have that with watching sheep dogs work. You know, they're almost so remote from their owner working off instinct that you're just like, how do you get a dog to do that? Like, I wouldn't even know where to start, honestly. I really wouldn't. Once again, the old shepherd, teach your dog in a cartwheel around you, Barbara, in a circle around you, because pack dogs work in circles. If a dog runs away, it'll only go in a straight line for so long, then it'll start to circle. Teach them in a circle until they are 100% in that circle. Do not try and teach them it outside that circle. That's another one. Don't ask your dog to do 20 yards away, Barbara, where it won't do 10 yards away. So how do you how do you create that then, Barbara? Because, you know, I'm about to get my new lab puppy and I've just got a thing that I just really want to try and train him hands off as much as possible no lead you know real f- working with freedom I don't know how this is going to work but you know we see everybody now with their long lines don't we and we don't let the dog off the long line and, and that's really because of society and environment and everything you're up against is, is the majority of that problem but if I'm presenting you with this puppy and I know you would want one from a baby and be starting from scratch but what does that look like? You know, you're putting your four-month-old border collie, obviously it's seen sheep before, but you're going to go out on a training session with a four-month-old border collie. What does that look like? Have you got long lines in place? Have you got, you know, just good whistle training in place? What are you using? We do it, first of all, where you put half a dozen sheep inside a circular pen and the dog is on the outside. Okay. So it understands it never actually gets to the sheep and it works in a circle. Okay. Then you judge, is it going to be a dog that wants to come in and grip? Is it going to be a dog that's a wide-going dog? But then you bring it inside the circle so it works there. Then you make the circle bigger. You go to a, 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 a larger paddock and a bit larger until your dog is used to working. And if it does it wrong, then, I mean, <laughs> let me go back to my old shepherds again. If it goes wrong with your dog, Barbara, don't carry on. You're going to carry on until you get it right. You won't get it right. And if it went wrong in the corner of that field, it'll go wrong in the corner of that field the next time you take it out. Take it back, put it in its pan, and leave it to think about it. Next time you take it out, it'll wonder, it'll have worked it out, and it won't do it wrong again. And it's true, and people like to carry on. Years, years ago, my old Meg, I ran out the deer playing old trial. And trials on the venue was a once a year. And halfway up the course, you can't see where the sheep are, the dog can't see them. Halfway up, this is like three quarters of a mile out and up a mountainside, I gave her a whistle to blow her out wider and she went out. I went to the same trial the following year and I got there just as my run was being called out and I thought, oh, she's not going to see where direct the sheep come from. I stood her at my feet and I put her out on the right hand out run. And that dog passed out at exactly the same point where I'd whistled out the year before. Wow. And the shepherds used to say, if your dog crosses the course when you go to a trial, you're wasting your time going to that venue again because it'll cross it again. You need to blow out this one before it actually starts to cross. Otherwise, because they'll remember and they will. It's a memory trick. I know what I did last year. I'll do it again this year. Wow. If you've got a dog that's used to being a distance from you, you have to put it on the long line. So when we take the rescue dogs in, we put them on a 10-metre line. And when they get to nine metres, we stop them. They never get to the end and pull, we stop them. So they always work within a 10 metre circle around us. Eventually, and it can take six, seven months of that, but eventually, that's the circle they're working. So as you go forward, they'll never be more than nine or 10 metres away from you. But with a puppy, puppies want to follow the mum. Yeah. They don't need mum, she won't let them go far away. Just as we don't let children wander off away from us when we take them out. So the puppy wants to be with you when you get it, you're all it's got. So it would always want to be with you. Why would a dog want to run away from you? Yeah. It's because people let it before it understands it has to stay with you. They encourage it to go. Then they call it back, but it doesn't know what the recall is. So you call it two or three times and it hears it two or three times. It has to hear it two or three times before it needs to come back to you. And when it gets to that third pitch, your voice is different. It's not what it was the first time you called it. Mm-hmm. So... I teach recall in the house, you know. Really good dog. 
Mm. Right? Every time it comes to me in the kitchen, that says to me, good dog. So they're watching me all the time. And the circle, you see, when the dog goes away from you, it is forward. The, the eyes, the nose, the ears pick up what's in front. And that is now more interesting than you are. So you're, you're blanked out of it. You see, I don't mean they're running madly around you in circles. But when they're always working both sides onto you, they've always got one eye and one ear on you. The other thing I wanted to just visit with you, we had a brief discussion about when we were working with the Kelpie Border Collie Cross Moscow, was this memory thing. I literally, this is why I love our little organisation that we've got each other to pull on in the CFBA because I think that brings such an amazing level to what we can offer our clients. But I literally wanted to spend hours on the phone to you picking your brains about this Border Collie memory thing because... That was such a turning point for me. So I think at the time I spoke to you, we'd got Moscow to about 14 days or something on a program going really, really well. The client said to me on day one, everything we try with him, Joe, he's great for about two or three days and then he reverts and he reverts to his poor behaviour worse than he was before because of obviously habit and, and memory and it's boring now. They didn't say this to me, but what they actually really wanted from me were timelines and I kind of said to you, we're at this point now and realistically, have we cracked this or are are we just sitting ducks here waiting for him to revert? And you gave me the three week window, which just literally was imprinted on my brain. And I took it to the client and I just said to her, because ha- you have to give your clients hope, don't you, to keep them motivated. Yeah. And I just said to her, right, once I get you over three weeks, we're done and dusted because Barbara Sykes says so. And it's, you know, <laughs> that no was, pressure. that was no pressure. <laughs> But it was amazing because it gave them, because otherwise they were they were constantly living this with this negative dark cloud over their head that any minute now he might just revert and be how he was before. But at the point that they got to three weeks, they were like, yay, we're home free. And now we're months on and they are home free. But I, I just want really to kind of hear from you about this memory thing that they have that seems to be very specific to Border Collies. The dog lives in the moment. Yeah. So we can bring up things from the past as we want. We can sit down on a night and think of something that happened years ago that warms as we feel lovely over it. Or we can sit down and think about something that angers us. Or we can think about something that we know is going to make us cry. But we'll make it, we'll drag that memory up. The dogs aren't like that, but they have the triggers. So, example, my best dog, um, when he was a puppy, his hand reared. When he was a pup, probably about... Well, probably about a year old or something like that. He'd been out and he got tangled up with a lot of birds. So I got some scissors to try and cut off because I just couldn't get them out of him. And I said to my daughter, just hold him. And he can't use your voice to a deaf dog and I'm at his back end, so he couldn't see my face. To this day, all I did was put two birds off. To this day, if that dog sees a pair of scissors, he's off. I don't know why, but scissors upset him. Wow. So it, it is the memory triggers. We had a dog... Um, that I took in years ago, uh, anybody wearing a deer stalker with a beard or smelling of Jace fluid, and that dog would turn aggressive towards <laughs> that person. Wow. And this is where it goes wrong for us as humans. I walk past that red car and I am scared of it. You don't know why I'm scared. I don't know why I'm scared. But it brings up something that tells me that it's danger. I have to be careful of it. I don't like it. It scares me. It could give me pain, but I don't know why. Once I've gone past it, it's gone. But you can't let go of it. You're worried about that red car. You're worried about what happened to me. You're imagining what might have happened to me. Now you're making me scared. Yeah. You see how that works? Yeah. It is the memory trigger. It can be perfume. It can be, let's say, high-vis jacket. For some reason, dogs are petrified of people wearing a high-vis jacket. And the dogs that are scared of traffic, when I hear people say, oh, well, I was told to take it to the roadside and let it get used to the traffic. Now it's used to it. Yeah, but it's safe and you is destroyed mm. because you are subjected to something that terrified it. So for us, it's no, you don't see a hybrid jacket. For as long as possible, you won't see one. And I'm not going to take you to the road because you're scared of it. Let's start, first of all, and build up the confidence. And let's get that out of your memory because if you see a high vis jacket every day, if you see a car every day, I'm reminding your memory there is a problem. So I'm going to take it out of your memory just as if it was on a computer. And every time you use it, it's on the desktop. And I'm never going to get rid of it. If I delete it on the computer, it's still on the hard drive to be found if necessary. But there's other things on that computer desktop. It's gone down. So 
So that's what we're going to do with the dog's memory bank. You're not going to see a car, you're not going to see a high jacket. And gradually, I'm going to put other things on your memory bank, such as um, a lovely walk. Let's roll a ball towards you and you push it back to me. Let's learn some new words. Now, we're going to start walking down the lane and you're going to see a car and you're going to have a little bit of worry about you. So I'm going to backstep six paces. So it's not lodged in your memory bank now. It's just a distant memory and you're going to see it go past. Then I'm going to go back home. And there's a high-vis jacket over the wall there. I've already taught you a leaf command. So we're going to walk past it with you on the other side of the high-vis jacket. And I'm going to tell you to leave. And it'll be at a great big distance until you learn that it isn't anything to be frightened of. It will always be in your memory bank. You will never understand why, but they'll always be there. But you have learned to trust me when you see them because we have that bond between us. I've got people in situations that, you know, step out of their front door and there's cars, uh, you know, p- particularly people in big cities, and they unfortunately, border collies do end up in big cities. So obviously I'm sure what you're not saying is you can't walk your dog. I'm sure they have to look for other ways of, of exercising the dog. Or tell me what time period you right, okay. would stop exposing right, them. Another, day, another way then. Um, if they're in a big city with no garden and no yard, then you're on to a no open unless yeah. they're going to put the dog in the car and drive it somewhere. Yeah. But hopefully there's going to be a garden there. Your dog will always talk to you. It will always tell you what it's thinking. So for a start off, when you come out of the door, the dog has to be behind. You have to be the one that is going to take the problem, yeah. not the dog or the handler. Yeah. You must be the one that's going to take the problem. So we wait in the doorway with the dog behind and then we walk out and we stand the dog at the back of us. Now, this car's going past. So we move the dog to the side and we watch. And as long as it's not that frightened, it has to go back in again, you take another step. The minute those ears start to spitter, the minute the eyes are starting to break, you stop. Yeah. And you put your leg across the front of the dog, and you back facing forward. Talk to the dog really, really calmly. And if it settles down... Wait a few minutes and go back in. If you're still a little bit stressed, go back in, but next time don't take it as far. It has to learn. It is total, total baby steps yeah. of going just that bit further down the garden. It's the trust. Yeah. It isn't the fact that the dog is going down the garden towards the car that it doesn't like. It's a trust issue. When people say to me, look, oh, my dog is aggressive with other dogs, but it's fine when it's off the lead. Well, it has a trust issue. Yeah. It isn't trusting you to protect it. So it's a trust issue with the car. That, well, those cars have scared me. I don't know what to do. I can't get after them to try and control them. And you're not helping. Yeah. That's basically what the dog is saying. And, I mean, I've had people who said, but my dog just won't come out of the door. It, it won't. Well, it has to do. You have to take it out and it has to go because um, there's two examples. One lady, she said, the minute I get the dog down to the garden path, I can't get it on the pavement. And it's not that it's frightened of traffic. It's just frightened of going out. Well, You've got to make it go two strides because every time she makes that, every time that dog digs its toes in, she takes it back home. Yeah. It digs its toes in. So you've got to take it two more strides and then tell it what a good dog it is, then go back home. Yeah. So doing that extra two strides each time. And there was one lady who said that she couldn't get a dog out the front door and she sent me loads of videos. And it wasn't, she, she was deceiving, it was the door and the traffic on the road. But she said, once I get it on the road, it's fine. It was her car. Her car was parked in the driveway, oh. and it was petrified of her car. Wow. So we take her car away, get the dog to trust us to go up and down the drive, yeah. then go past her car on the road, then finally go past it on the, on the, on the drive. You need to ease it yeah. out of the memory bank while you're easing other things in. You can't just take it out of the memory bank. We've yeah. got to say, right, we're taking the high-vis jacket away for quite some time, but we're going to replace it with other things while we build up this trust so that you trust me with absolutely everything. What time limits are you, you talking about here, Barbara? So, I mean, for me, I don't really have big windows like you when you work with dogs. You get clients committed for a couple of weeks if you work really hard and then life starts to get in the way. So if I was to say to somebody, you've got a six-week period of no high-vis and no traffic, that's kind of a done deal. That's probably a dog being rehomed for the majority of clients. But what I tend to do, and I think maybe it falls in line with what you're saying is drip feed a little bit of pressure but do lots of into the pressure out of the pressure they do have to take it out for at least a three-week window three weeks you you can't put 
enough into the dog's memory bank. Go back to the computer again. Yeah. Right, I've got a small computer here. I've got something on the desktop that I don't want. So I'm going to put a lot of other things on to get rid of it. Yeah. But the amount of things you've got to put on your computer is going to start working slow. It can't take it. Yeah. So you, a dog can only process one thing at a time. It can't process a lot of things, which is why it goes wrong when people are trying to teach you fitness, they and lie down all at once. It needs to process it and get it in its head and understand it. Because when you move on to something else, it will temporarily lose what it just learned. It yeah. will store it for future use. Example, working dogs around sheep, you teach them to outrun and fetch them to you. And then you start to teach them to drive sheep away. And then people ring up and say, it's forgotten it's left and right. No, it hasn't. It's just stored it because it can't take too much in at once. It's stored it. Once you've got it driving them away properly, it'll bring back the left and right. It's there. I've lost it. Yeah. Too rare. So you can't teach them too much at once. So you're going to take the hydra's jacket out and then you're going to have to say, right, now we're going to plant some other things in here, but you can't plant all the other things in at once. The biggest, most important thing is trust. Yeah. If that dog doesn't trust, then the window is going to be massive. So the first thing to build up on is the trust and to take away all the tidbits and the treats that they've been having because that doesn't instill confidence into the dog. To be that love thing, that thing inside that says, we're going to beat this and we've only got three weeks, we're going to beat it because I love you so bloody much <laughs> that we will make this work. You have to trust me. Yeah. If, if they're not going to get that, it will end up in rescue. Well, that's why, you know, what we do with regards to the psychology element and the behaviour is so powerful. I had a colleague years ago that I, I took the lead out of the client's hand. We did some stuff together. Dog was amazing. Dog worked for me beautiful. Literally just voice, no treats, no ball, no nothing. Really low-key stuff, simple stuff. Sit, stay, wait, follow me. Lovely lead work. What a beautiful boy. Fantastic. I gave the lead back to the client. The dog turned around and bit me. I don't know how I got away with it, but it literally ripped a hole out of my jeans. And I was absolutely shocked. I mean, there was just, where on earth did that come from? It was just such a a shocking behaviour from a dog. And, you know, it really taught me a lesson in how an owner can negatively affect a dog's behaviour and that actually our rehab programmes being as heavily focused on changing their relationship and improving it is why it's so successful. For me, it's not a lot to do with training in the sense of the word sit stay lay down at all really what I do that is an element of it but I find that really easy once you've got a good relationship you know this is all about building amazing relationships with our dogs with you being that support system for them 99 out of 100 when they've got a problem with the dog it's been lavished with everything Mm. it's probably been fed on rocket fuel it's certainly got lots of toys and it's certainly had lots of treats and the hardest thing for them to take on board is Get rid of them. You've given your dog everything but confidence in you. Yeah. And you need to take them all away and start looking at your dog as a little four-legged person. It's into kiddies, it's a little four-legged person, it has a brain, and it, it, it needs to know that you're going to parent it and you've not parented it. And it's amazing how many times I've said, you've got grown-up children. Did you give them sweets? Is that like, oh, God, no. Well, why are you doing it to your dog? Oh, I get you, yeah, you're, oh, no, I wouldn't let my kids do that, no. But your parent, you, but these dogs have to be parented. They have to have boundaries. It, instead of the, what a lot of them think, go back to the high vis again, if I take the high vis jacket away and I'll talk to my dog and give you lots of treats, will that be all right? No. You would take the high vis jacket away and sit down and talk to that dog. Put a bubble over its head. And if you think it's saying, I don't understand you and I don't know what you want, well, then, somewhere along the line, You've got a total breakdown in communication. You need to see the couple over that dog that is saying back to you, I love you, what do you want me to do? They don't talk to their dog, they talk at it. We're going out for a walk now. Do you want to tweet it? Do you want to treat it? Do you want to play ball? They're talking at it. Go back again, the person who, I don't know why I always use fans, but I do, the French person who cannot speak a word of English and you cannot speak a word of French. You have to build up some kind of communication between you. You have to learn to get on together and you have to learn to study each other to be able to find out what each other wants and what you're trying to ask for. And it's the same with the dog. You need to build up that relationship. You need to look at it as a dog and not just keeping throwing things at it. It has a right to have respect and it should give respect. But at the same time, when you take that dog into your home, it did not knock on your door and say, I want to come and live with you. 
Yeah. I want to learn how humans live and I want to do the same. The person went out and took that dog and brought it into their home. They took it away from everything it knew yesterday. This is a total new beginning for it. And if we want to get on with that dog, in just the same way we want to get on with a person who can't speak English, we have to learn to understand French as well as they have to learn to understand English. We have to give up being human for a while and think dog. Yeah. Understand it. Ask it what it wants, not perceive that you know what it wants. Ask it what it wants and what it needs. Yeah. Why does your dog sleep under the window? Well, it chose to sleep there. Yes, but that's because it can see out. You should, in that case, have given it somewhere calmer because it's getting wound up under the window. Yeah. Well, my dog wanted to sleep in that corner, but I put its bed by the fire. But your dog is a nervous dog. It was telling you where. They'll always tell us. We do a thing when people come on a consultation. Stand the dog at the side of you. And you ask somebody to walk slowly, and I do mean snail pace, towards you, directly towards you and the dog. Watch that dog. And first of all, the ear will flicker, and the eyes, sometimes it'll take a step back. And I see it look up at the handler, and say, well, what are you going to do about this? And the handler doesn't do anything, because they're not reading the dog. Yeah. And the dog is saying, I've got a situation here, and I'm uncomfortable. Every, every bit of that dog is talking, its ears, its eyes, its nose is twitching, everything. And if you just step across the front of that dog and put it behind you, it relaxes. So we get the walk towards the dog and see what the dog is saying. And we say, all right, now go back and start again. But this time the dog's going to stand behind me. And the dog's turning away, hooking away. It's not interesting. Yeah. So I've got two really important Border Collie related questions for you, given mm-hmm. what's going on probably up near you with regards livestock. The last podcast that I did with Ross McCarthy, we were chatting actually about e-collars. So we we wanted to kind of open up some of these more controversial topics. Do you have an opinion, Barbara, on, and I'm talking professionals, I'm not talking about the layman because the layman buying collars off Amazon is just barbaric. Myself included, I don't work or use them. So don't consider that I would be in a position to, to pick up a piece of equipment like that. But likewise, we were talking about Jamie Penrith, who's busy advocating the use of e-collars at the minute. And I've seen him work and he works in a very humane way with them. Do you have an opinion on professional trainers using e-collars in a professional, humane way to stop dogs or collies specifically killing sheep and livestock? You're making me unpopular again now, aren't you? I'm <laughs> pushing you into a corner. We want Barbara Sykes's opinion. If you're an e-collar, then you're not professional. I'm sorry, that's my ter- That's the way I see it. So a border collie that's killed a sheep, let's say it comes to you, how would you successfully go about training that border collie out of not chasing and killing livestock without using oh, harsh levels I of would equipment? Ne- I would never, ever, just as I think kids and dogs should grow up together, I don't trust the dogs and I don't trust kids, but to be monitored, I would never, ever trust any dog around sheep. It's a dog. Lock it in this building with a sheep and don't feed it for a week and you'll have a dead sheep when you come yeah, back and it. Absolutely. The dog is the dog. But if we send a sheep chaser in, and we, I've got one now. It's, it's a beautiful dog. It's lovely with people. It's just a rat bag when it comes to sheep. He's going to have them. Mm. He doesn't see them. He's not allowed to see them. He was about a month. He's been taught to walk on the lead properly. You will not pull. You will walk sensibly with me. When I tell you to stand behind me, you'll stand behind me. And he's been taught to leave command. And he's been taught it on any bird that moves. He's been taught it if he looks at somebody walking down the path, leave it, come to me, look at me, come on, look up at me. So we teach them, leave it and come and look at me. And once I've got that into that dog, really into it, he'll start seeing sheep at a distance. Leave it and look at me, that's a good lad. So that we get them so that they can walk past sheep. But when he gets adopted, they'll be told, don't walk through a field full of sheep yeah. and don't ever let him off where the sheep. Yeah. But then people are letting their dogs off where there's life. But we've got a footpath close to our farm and they're a pain in the neck because they're letting the dogs run loose. Electric collars, I just don't agree with them. I think it's wrong. Yeah, it's such a controversial topic. I mean, it's just good to get other people's opinions on it, really. One big question I have for you is on obsessive compulsive behaviours. So I see a lot of collies for various things like shadow chasing reflections of people's watches which you know seemingly has a neurological element the main thing just that little bit i can't use the word manic because they aren't <laughs> manic they aren't born that way it's creative but if you go back you can find out what's happened to them in the beginning there will be both there they will have watched the t- 
television, it, I, I'm putting all this in the book, yeah. don't let your dog stop the TV. It might be funny now, but it won't be when it's older. Because they do become obsessed. Example, if we're training the dog to work sheep, and then you suddenly let it out one morning, it goes, sheep, where's the sheep heels? Right, now you're becoming obsessed with your job. You're brilliant. You're a great work dog, but that's all you want. So you're not going to do it for a while. And then the next time we're going out field, we're going to walk all the way around the edge, and you're going to see those sheep, and you're not going to work them. And we're going to do that for a week until you realise working sheep is not the be all and end all. It's part of your life and part of your job. But usually, when a dog becomes obsessive, it has been encouraged at the beginning, unless it's the boredom of shadow chasing. But even then, it, it happens. They don't invent these things themselves as a rule. It's happened to them in a pet situation. Oh, that gets me attention. I'll do it again. Yeah. Now the dog's obsessed with it. Yeah. Just one one thing I want to tell you that I've got at the start of the book because I think it's important for people to understand what these dogs were like originally. Going back to goodness knows how long ago, because there was no such things as wagons, etc., they would probably have to drive sheep 100 miles, 200 miles to the market and they'd do it with the dogs and they'd stop off at inns on the way. When the sheep were sold, those drovers would take their stagecoach off and casual every one back the 100 miles or so to the stead in where they live. Very rare were the dogs allowed on because they were smelly. So the dogs made their own way home. And they would stop at each one of the little inns that they stopped at on the way down where food and water would be waiting for, paid on by the shepherd. They made their way back on exactly the same track that they'd gone driving the sheep to market. Which to me, that is totally amazing. And it was the life, that was the life they led. That's how independent and bright they are. I think their independence is quite amazing, actually. When you watch them work, once they're confident and they know what they're doing, that that's it, they go off. And, you know, whereas my lab checks in with me on a regular basis. And it's, it's interesting what you say about how much you kind of affect them with regards to their early learning and stuff. And I know for me with, with Hogan... I did his training focused on a tennis ball, controlled tennis ball. He's six now. He's amazing. Um, But it's actually at the point now where I have to be very careful about when and how a tennis ball comes out. Like it has to be very controlled because he will be obsessive with it. And, you know, and I don't think I did anything obsessive. I didn't throw a ball for him. We don't have ball chuckers. It was, if I did anything with a ball, it was just as, yeah, good boy. There you go. Have a ball. But that was so closely linked to me. That little yellow ball is, a, is about my praise. The next one, I'll be very careful about how much time we spend focused on using one object. It, you know, when I look at these OCD cases, I do think, what, what are we doing to our dogs rather than this is a problem with the dog, so it's good to hear that you kind of agree with that, really. They only have what we feed into them, and we all of us make mistakes. I don't care how good somebody yeah. is with the dog, don't make a mistake. I think the difference when you've had lots of dogs and you've studied them, like we have, you have, mm. then you recognise the mistake and you, you can get out of it. Yeah. Whereas the person who's had a couple of dogs in a lifetime makes a mistake, they don't recognise it, it's too late, and they don't know how to get out of it. But, I mean... All the dogs in our rescue have fun, but it's a different kind of fun. If they're crazy over a ball, they don't get a ball. Yeah. If there's, there's quite a, we have those jolly balls, and they like to play with those because they're, they're independent and play them on their own. <laughs> but we do a lot of search with them. And it's, it's just fun seeing the different dogs. We have one dog, she'll look up a tree. She's convinced, always convinced we put it up a tree. So she thinks it's going to be up a tree. And we have another dog who will drop it down somewhere, and he'll go and look at it. Are you going to bring it to me? No, it's dirty. Oh, you'll pick it up. You'll put it there, you'll pick it up. They always show us. But just so different. Yeah. And we don't try to make them do it our way. And I think that's the big thing. A lot of people think this is a game and this is how it should be played and the dog must play it this way. We let the dogs decide how to play it and then we play along with them. Yeah. So how many rescues have you got at the minute? Do you know? I know that you're full because we spoke about this. And there's a sanctuary dog wow. that can't be rehomed because of bathing issues. And we've got such a lot of these COVID dogs in, it's heartbreaking. What, really young? Was, uh, yeah, somebody messaged yesterday. Um, it's 10 months old. Mm. Um, she was sat on the park bench and flung her arms around it to kiss it and it bit her face so she had to have stitch to mm. She couldn't understand why it did it and tried to hook it later on and it's bitten again. Oh so it will be dead now, I think. She said, can you take it? I cannot invent a space I don't have. So they're booked in to put to sleep. Ten months old, for goodness sake. Yeah, they all are. Well, That's exactly why, why I'm I know, seeing them. I know. And, and this, 
bring their arms around and kiss and you, you know what? Tess, both tricolor, long coated tricolor Tess and my bonnet, short coated tricolor, they will actually go up and hug anybody and let anybody hug them. If, if I say to them, because they're both ambassador dogs of the trust, yeah, go and you can go, that person wants to cuddle. My death dog, it's like, why do I want somebody hugging me and stroking me? Mm-hmm. It's just not a tactile dog. And I, I don't think we always see dogs as individuals as the do you like being hugged? And just sometimes, a 10 month old collie flinging your arms around it on a park bench and giving it a big Ugh. kiss, it is asking for trouble. Yeah, and then to do it again. What, what's that oh, about? It doesn't, I give up. I totally give up with some people. I don't know I really how do. many more signals you need, really. You might, surely one dog bite to the face is enough to know that you don't go back and ask for another one. Do the same thing no. again. But you sad. see, there's so many people getting dogs that haven't had a dog before, or they're getting a breed of dog that they haven't researched. And if you're going to research the collar, you are researching multiples of a breed yeah. because they're all so different. So you have got, is it out now, your new book? It comes out in November. I'm very excited. So this is Living with Border Collies, right? So we've got training, we've got understanding, we've got the dog aggression, we've got training puppies and we've got dogs and children. Now we've got Living with Border Collies is your latest. Cole would ask me to write it. Because they said we're understanding that people are getting that they're not understanding the breed. So can can you write a book on that? Oh, yeah, okay, but fair enough. And it, it is, and I, I have actually put in the forward to it. I'm a hope I've made every chapter interesting enough that people don't want to skip a chapter, because it's vital at the start at the beginning. If people think, oh, I don't need to know about the history of it, well, actually you do, because that's the foundation. Can you see the old shepherds? If you put a shoddy foundation down, you'll only ever be able to build a bungalow. Yeah. And sometimes that bungalow isn't good enough. And if the walls crack, you bring it down again. Yes. If you put in an absolute rock solid, steady, thick foundation, you can build a mansion. And if you don't have the history of the dog, you don't have the foundation to be able to build up the different characters to understand them when you get them. There's a chapter on them with children. There's a chapter on choosing a rescue, where to get a dog from. There's a chapter on taking your puppy home. There's bits and bobbles, some fabulous photos in it. Oh, well, I'm definitely going to be purchasing myself a copy of that. Hopefully a signed one, with any luck. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it just, I think, because I sent you the cover, didn't I? It does say on the back of it that the history in that, and there's a chapter on sheep dog trialling. Once you get past the history of the collie, where it is with children, apart from the eye and the colour genes, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that is interesting for people of other breeds. If you can live with a border collie, you can live with the most breeds. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Understand the border collie, and if that works out well, well, most of the breeds will be a bit of a double. Absolutely. Because they're complex, but that's what makes them so amazing. And they, they can't. And if anybody says to me, my border collie was perfect, I think, ah, that's boring. It never was. No. <laughs> the border collie then. They, they, they're not. They're, they are bred to make decisions. They are good decisions. They're problem solvers. They love solving problems. That's what they do when they're working sheep. They're solving problems all the time. So give them a problem to solve that doesn't involve treats and food. Give them something to work out and they'll work it out. Well, let's wrap up. Um, my brain is blown. So hopefully the listeners will feel the same and your knowledge is insane. And it's always lovely to speak to you. Where can people find you? There's two websites. Border Collies dot co dot uk that's mainline border collie centre in the bay from unit the rescue which is based here is s4stbc dot org dot uk both have got telephone numbers on uh, people with behavioural problems if they go to the border collies dot co dot uk they're um, they just email into us we, we respond or they will give us the ring or we'll have a chat to you if we can solve something over the phone we will try and do it if there's any aggression there, we say, no, you're going to have to book in. We won't treat aggression over the phone. And whereabouts are you based, Barbara? Good old West Yorkshire. <laughs> Can you tell by the accent, any Yorkshire <laughs> people? I know where you're from. <laughs> yeah. oh, Yorkshire, good old Yorkshire. Good old Yorkshire. Livestock country, definitely. Well, listen, I am eternally grateful for this. Hopefully people will reach out and try and setting the dog up to succeed is always my thing, which is why I'm doing this stuff. And having people on the podcast like you with so much knowledge is always great. So thank you very much. Is there any final words for anybody? Yeah. 
if you go to a toy seat for what it is and love it for what it is, it doesn't matter if it's got some quirks, understand it, try and understand its language instead of making it understand yours and just love it for its craziness because that's, that's part of the fun of them. Like my crazy dog that set off swimming to the other flaming yeah. coast. Goodness knows how many hundreds of miles away. Hi. Running through the sea in my trousers laughing at the thing, you know, I'm going to end up in Belgium or Denmark somewhere I don't know. You need to send her my way. I love a bit of swimming with my dog. I swim for miles. I've just, uh, I've got it. We're doing a triathlon in a few months' time, Hogan and I. So he's got to swim 80 metres, bike 2.5k, and run 2.5k attached to me. So you can always send her my way and she can do some swimming with me. <laughs> oh, do you know what? Can I just say something I was going to say a few minutes ago? Go on. Um, oh, my God. Gosh, she looks at me off. Um, <laughs> the, 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 border Collies will tell you about their past if you listen to them. We we were three weeks with the doggy rescue. But we tried to work out what it's past is. If it's come from a pound, we try to work it out. If it's come from a home, we try to work out how much of what they told us was true and what wasn't. But there are times when people have said to me that dog's been beaten, and I said, no, it hasn't. It really hasn't. Um, I can remember being at a sheep dog trial, and I was trying to get the sheep into the pen, and I waggled my stake, and my old Meg dog stepped back, and somebody said, oh, she beats her dog. I've had that dog since it was four weeks old. I've never laid a finger on her. But the sensitive ones will do it. You need to watch them. If a dog, if you raise a hand and a dog cowers to the floor and it stays there and its tail is down, then that dog might have had some abuse. But if you raise your hand and the dog cowers to the floor and you turn your back and it stands up and goes, that got you, didn't it? It's not had abuse. It's just an instant reaction just to sometimes... You can go up behind my son and poke him in the back and he goes, what are you doing? Do that to my daughter and she jumps sky high. They're just the same. Some of them jump like that. Yeah. After my little bitch of a sheepdog trial, it stepped back when I waggled a stick. She bit a sheep and put it in the pen and got me disqualified. Oh, my God. So you've got to listen to the whole conversation at the same time. Not yeah. just the part of it before you make a judgment. I always think it's really sad because I see so many doing that over threshold reactive stuff and you just want to go, oh no, because you just know it's, there are so many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle for those owners that are working all day or they've got young kids that they've got to try and put these things together. They've gone and bought these dogs and, and they're completely over dogged as, as I call it. You know they're fixable, they're all fixable, you know, and having good owners, Moscow's owners were amazing. I'd love for you to have met them, to be honest, because they were on their knees. And I walked in to the, to do the visit and his words were, I'm going to listen to you, Joe, because we want to try and see what we can do before we rehome him. But short of a major miracle, I don't think anything you tell us is going to work. That's what he said. And I went back 10 days later and he went, you performed your major miracle. And it, you know, just for me, the the buzz that you get, I mean, I'm 47 years old now. I've worked with dogs since the age of 11. I set my dog walking business up and then went into vet medicine. You still get that buzz at 47 years old, having worked with animals. That is, is not many professions that you can get that. Like, I don't know what well, I would do without sorry, I'm 73 and I will go to an international sheepdog trial. And I will get a lump in my throat. And I do when I see these dogs doing what they can do because it's emotional. And when so, if somebody's going to try, I will work my socks off for them. Yeah. But if they're not going to try, I just think, well, you ruined it and now you're just passing it on. 73. Did you actually just yeah. say you're 73? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'll be exactly the same. Like, yeah, I've had these conversations with my husband and you do realise that I'm... I'll never stop doing what I'm doing. I would love to be at the stage where I don't need to charge for what I do financially. Sure. If I didn't have a mortgage, that would be amazing and two really expensive kids and animals. But um, because I would love to, to do stuff, this is my doing stuff for free because I just I just think this I can do, I love. And, you know, it doesn't, apart from my time and other people's time, it's not costing, um, you know, major amounts of money to be able to put out this information. So, you know, I try and do this. The consults, unfortunately, have to pay for that. So... Yeah, I mean, who knows? Uh, hopefully, I'll be seventy three and still doing doing this and preaching like you are, which is amazing. The secret is to be nosy. And I keep saying I have so much I want to do that I've not had time to do with doing the rescue of these last twenty years, and there's so many things that not just that I want to do. There's, there's things I want to see, and I don't want to miss out. I'm going to be at least a hundred. Because <laughs> your time, your timeline can't run out. That's what you've got to do. Bucket That's list. It. That's it. Got to keep going. <laughs> I love that.
<laughs> oh, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, as always. We're moving, by the way. I think we've been able to buy a boarding car. Oh, have you? Where, where are you going? Still Yorkshire, though, right? Oh, God, yeah, it's only 17 miles away, but it means we can expand, take more dogs in, oh, and the God. rescue will be not dependent on us on the farm. It will have the boarding camps to support it as well. So, If someone wants to rehome, we didn't touch on this, if somebody wants to rehome a dog from you, um, mm-hmm. obviously it will be a rehab dog, I'm sure, in many situations, um, or dog undergoing rehab. Um, what markers do they need to hit? Because this is the other big thing with most, you know, all these imported rescue dogs are, are finding homes in the UK because our UK rescue charities have so many criteria, like, you know, if you've got children, then we can't have a dog. If you work more than four hours a day, you can't have a dog. So people really struggle. So what criteria have you got for putting these, these collies in? We don't, we don't have a set thing like a lot of them do. We've got to have a garden, you've got to have a wall, you've got to have this, that and the other. And we do say on the website, um, we, we believe dogs and children are good together. But please do not criticise us if we say we're not going to rehome you because a lot of the dogs that come in have got issues where they can't go where there's children. And if there are children involved, we need to see those kids because even the, the nice dogs, I wouldn't want to some of the families with kids. We work different to a lot of rescuers because people go about home checks and I don't do home checks. I'm not homing to bricks and mortar, I'm homing to people. Yeah. Yeah. Google, Google tells me where they live and whether they've got a garden or not. And if I'm suspicious enough to think I need to do a home check, then Wouldn't. they're not the right thing no, to have a dog. Absolutely. And it was so just great. That's sort of the way we work with it. But everybody is different. And we do get some dogs in that will be nice with kids and we do get people with nice kids. Yeah. Um we we take everything. I owned a dog a long time ago to a guy who had been refused by three rescues because he had a backyard with a very low wall, and he wasn't allowed to hire it because of his neighbours. Then across the footpath to an allotment, but he wasn't allowed to fence the allotment off completely. And a very tiny kitchen. But nobody let him have a dog. And I had a dog that was crying out for this guy. It had been beaten, and it was in a state, and I just got it to come around. I thought, I don't know, I don't know I'm going to get this dog to. And I talked to him for ages, and I said, you will have to create this dog to start with. Because if the door is oh no, no problem, he said, I said, but you can't. You can't create it in your kitchen, it's too small. He saw the legs off his table and put the top of the table on the top of the crate. Oh. And he had that dog up to it dying at 14 years old. Oh, that's true. so nice. Oh, that's so, right, though. But nobody else went home to him. But the man was a lovely man. There was no way he would have lost that dog. It was just lovely. Oh. You've been a star. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. Thanks, Barbara. Have a lovely day. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening this week. I hope you found the podcast informative. And please do subscribe if you want to hear more topics. They'll be brought to you over the next few weeks.